Many of us dream of a tropical vacation and a break from the monotony of working. A place to kick back and relax among palm trees and the calming sounds of lapping ocean waves. For many tourists, the idyllic island of Koh Tao, located in the Gulf of Thailand, is just the place to visit and vacation. Known for its cheap hotels, gorgeous scenery, wild parties, and crazy nights, it's a very popular island for British backpackers, among many other travelers. Yet, this tranquil, beautiful vacation spot has recently seen a series of grisly tourist murders and earned the haunting nickname, Death Island. What is up, Iwu crew? Today, we are taking a look at Thailand's Death Island, the site of many gruesome deaths and murders, as well as the home to a deceitful cult. If you enjoy true crime, mysteries, and true stories, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. Now, let's get into it. In 2017, Elise Dalimagna, a 30-year-old Belgian backpacker, had been traveling around Asia for two years after completing a degree in medicine from the Europe Institute of Medicine Naturelle in Brussels. Seeking something other than wild parties like the many others who visited the Thai islands of Koh Tao and Koh Phangan, she and her two female friends started living at a yoga and tantra ashram with the Satya Sai Baba guru, Raman Andreas. Elise was a beautiful young woman at the prime of her life seeking spiritual advancement at the center. The controversial Satya Sai Baba religion has 1,200 worship centers over 126 different countries, and the reported number of followers ranges from 10 million up to 50 million, depending on the source. Sai Baba, after whom the religion is named, is the leader of the religious group and is arguably the most famous Swami or Hindu religious leader. Specifically in India, he was one of the most prominent spiritual leaders, though he is known worldwide. Before he died, Sai Baba proclaimed himself as divinity in human form and told his followers that he was omnipresent, meaning he could be present everywhere in the world at the same time. To those who are devoted to his religious practices and teachings, Sai Baba was God on earth and they believed that he was born of a virgin mother. His following believes that their leader can conduct resurrections and miraculous healings using his holy ash. Some of his own powers apparently included being clairvoyant, so he could see into the future, and being able to travel across the world just by manifesting out of thin air. Like a magician, he could perform fantastic feats like producing wristwatches and sacred stones out of nowhere to present to a crowd. The mythology surrounding him lured many innocent travelers seeking enlightenment. In fact, there are many schools across Thailand specifically set up to carry out his teachings and induct more worshippers. People like Elise came to see Sai Baba or the other enlightened gurus within the Satya Sai Baba sect to learn from them and practice rituals of worship in order to live an altruistic lifestyle. People felt drawn to the compelling leader. Former follower Marc-André Saint-Jean told a reporter, The charisma of Sai Baba is incredible. The love was flowing from him. Tony Cleary, a middle-aged businessman from Vancouver who recently walked away from the sect after 15 years of extreme commitment, said that it is difficult to leave the religion because Sai Baba makes you feel so important because he tells you he's chosen you. But there is a dark side to the seemingly mystical and all-powerful Satya Sai Baba worship, and many people have recently started claiming the religion is a cult. More sinisterly, the Satya Sai Baba leader has faced decades of accusations of abuse against young males as well as allegations of fraud. The self-proclaimed Godman dismissed all accusations as smear campaigns to discredit him. As the disturbing accounts grew and details were shared about the abuse, Sai Baba began to lose followers, and many people felt betrayed by their once godlike leader. Besides, the allegations of fraud meant that the millions of dollars that followers donated to charity were mismanaged or used for personal gain. It is within this cult that Elise Dalimagna was living. 
Six years earlier, Sai Baba himself had passed away. Even though the allegations of abuse were well known and documented, many were still taken in by his teachings and chose to follow other gurus, such as Guru Raman Andreas, whom Elise stayed with on the island of Koh Phangan near Koh Tao. After a few months, Elise told people she was leaving the cult to go back home to Belgium. There was nothing concerning in her announcement as people regularly came and went from the ashram. But immediately after she left the Satya Sai Baba ashram, her mother, Michelle von Egtin, believes that Elise used a fake name, Elise Dubuis, to check into Triple B bungalows on Koh Tao, also known as Death Island as she was making her way to the capital city of Bangkok. In fact, she had written her real name on the hotel ledger and then scribbled it out and changed it to Elise Dubuis. Elise also refused to give her passport number, which is often standard at hotels, and insisted she would supply it later. But why? Why would Elise feel that she needed to hide her identity? These are not the actions of someone leaving the country just to return home. These are the actions of someone who is running and hiding. Was she indeed running from the Sai Baba cult? There is some suspicion online that it wasn't actually Elise who changed her name, but perhaps the people who killed her and later tried to cover up their tracks by scratching out her real name in the ledger to hide that she had ever been there. Regardless of speculation, the evidence seems to point towards the fact that she was fleeing something and needed to use a fake name to hide. Still, we do not know whom she was running from. Strangely, the critical evidence was likely lost in a mysterious fire that burned down three bamboo huts, including Elise's. The fire itself is very curious. Did whomever Elise was running from maliciously burn down the hut she was staying in? The police never looked into the lead and seemed to assume that the fire was just an unfortunate accident and completely unrelated to Elise's apparent escape. Following the fire, Elise then fled 2.5 kilometers through the jungle to Tenota Bay, where she got a room at the Poseidon Resort and bought another ticket for Bangkok that would leave on April 24th. But unfortunately, Elise would never make it there. It wasn't until eight days later that the locals became suspicious when they noticed some strange activity with the lizards who resided in the area. When they investigated, they stumbled across a horrifying sight. Elise's body was slightly hidden among the rocks in the Koh Tao jungle behind the hotel, half eaten by the lizards. She was only identified by her dental records and previous x-rays. The Thai police claim that Elise hung herself from a tree three days before she was discovered, but she had been found wrapped in old t-shirts or cotton shawls with an empty fuel bottle next to her. Could the fuel bottle have something to do with the fires? Perhaps Elise set the fires herself as a way to distract or confuse the people she seemed to think were after her. The police quickly ruled that Elise had taken her own life, but there was no note found near her or in her hotel room. What's more, Elise's bags mysteriously appeared on the ferry she was supposed to be on, though she herself never made it aboard. Her bags traveled all the way to Chumpon province. One of the only tangible pieces of evidence that authorities may have to show a glimpse into Elise's final moments is this haunting image captured from CCTV footage on the morning of April 21st. The black and white snapshot shows only the back of an ambiguous woman as she walks down a concrete path outside the Poseidon Resort at 9.03 a.m. sharp. Police claim that this photo depicts Elise heading down to purchase a speedboat ticket that she would later use. However, her mother, Michelle, says that the fuzzy girl in the picture is too big to be Elise. She was quoted saying, that's not Elise's silhouette. She was much slimmer. That's not the way she was walking. But even so, it's an undeniable fact that the image was snapped only 200 meters from where Elise's remains were soon discovered. 
It seems that Michelle and the local Thai police are at odds in more ways than one when it comes to the details of Elise's untimely demise, and they can't seem to agree on most aspects. Thai Police Chief Police Lieutenant Colonel Chok Chai Sutimek reportedly said that Elise's mother, Michelle, had told them that Elise had previously tried to end her life in the past, even though her mother has stated that she staunchly does not believe her daughter took her own life on Koh Tao. He then revealed that an unnamed source from Bangkok's Crime Suppression Division claimed that Elise tried to kill herself a few weeks before her death, on April 4th, at a Bangkok railway station, where she allegedly attempted to jump in front of the train but was saved by witnesses in the area. Supposedly, she was rescued by railway police after this incident and sent to an institute of psychiatry for a checkup before she reappeared in Koh Tao. Investigator Pumin Poonpanmoeng has been reportedly looking to verify if this incident did actually occur. As of today, he has not yet released a statement clarifying if Elise had tried to end her own life by jumping in front of a train or not. Elise's devastated mother is unconvinced. In an interview, Michelle said, Too many things show us that someone is involved. Police told us that Elise hanged herself up in the jungle. I cannot accept why my daughter should have killed herself. She was normal in the last conversation, and no signs of depression were visible. It doesn't make sense to her that her daughter would go through so many lengths to book two separate tickets to Bangkok, only to go into the forest and kill herself before she could ever leave. Michelle believes that someone else had to be involved in her daughter's demise, and her belief is furthered by the fact that the Thai authorities have been trying to cover up the recent deaths of tourists, including Elise's. Police told Michelle that there were no signs of fighting or a struggle on Elise's body, and there were no foreign objects or substances that could have caused loss of consciousness. Michelle had been promised to see the autopsy report that was claimed to be conducted at the Surat Thani Hospital where Elise's body was taken, but she has never seen it. Elise's body was cremated 14 days after the autopsy, and so Michelle's chance to finally have more information without that report is slim. Michelle also says that she has never seen any photographic evidence that her daughter had hung herself, even though it is standard police routine to photograph the crime scene. Thai journalists have revealed that they have been under mounting pressure to hide stories of tourists' deaths, which is part of an elaborate cover-up. Michelle claims that her daughter's death would have gone unnoticed if it hadn't been for her public appeal for help that brought attention to her case. Michelle said, We're more and more thinking that the police information is not the right explanation. Michelle has not given up hope. She is currently working with a German investigator to trace the locals who found Elise's body to hopefully dig up some actual answers about what happened. We were told by police in Koh Tao that they have no jurisdiction on the neighboring island Koh Phangan, so a lot of questions have not been investigated," she said. The police have even stated that the news of Elise's death is so old already and that there is nothing more to say. Desperate for any answers, Michelle has been trying to contact the German cult guru Ramen Andreas, whom she believes left the island of Koh Phangan when Michelle herself visited to retrace her daughter's footsteps. She thinks that the cult leader may be able to help and give her answers. Of course, there is much speculation that Elise could have been fleeing the Satya Sai Baba cult, or someone who was also part of the cult, but so far, there is no concrete link between her death and the cult. Raman Andreas admitted to the Mirror newspaper that he knew Elise and that she had spent time with him at the ashram, but he claimed that even though at her most recent visit, he had been occupied and didn't talk to her much. From what he did observe, his words were, her behavior was normal, she was definitely not sad. Yet even though he claimed not to know her very well, he told the newspaper that he knew Elise was happy before her death and that she had found peace and solitude. He also said, she told us she wanted to return back to Belgium so she could make some money in order to come back. 
Then, she had a Skype with her parents, announcing her plans. After this, we don't know what happened to her. The guru had previously been fairly unhelpful to authorities, trying to understand what happened to Elise, until he suddenly came forward in what seems to be an attempt to clear his name. Currently, the Thai police have stated that they are still investigating, but there have been no indications that Elise was murdered. And because Elise may have previously attempted to take her own life, they have little doubt about the cause of death. At the same time, much of the evidence is suspicious and doesn't add up. Elise's death is just one of 10 fatalities that have taken place in only six years on the notorious Death Island. The string of mysterious murders began back in 2012, when British traveler Ben Harrington had apparently crashed his motorbike into an electricity pylon. The story may have been easier for his family to accept if the Thai police had not acted so unreliably in the ensuing investigation. Ben's mother, Pat Harrington, did not believe that her son's death could have been an accident, especially when she had to fight the police to stop them from quickly cremating him and destroying any evidence. She had to call and scream down the phone just to stop them as they attempted to cremate Ben. She even had to pay 500 pounds to store Ben's body to fly it home to England which normally costs 10 pounds per day. The enormous price was believed to be a way to stop her from gaining access to her son's body. In fact, her other son had to be in Thailand to pay the sum and stay a week to ensure Ben's body was returned. Pat has spent years fighting the Thai authorities, including submitting a freedom of information request to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to no avail. In 2017, Five years after her son's death, Pat started a petition that gained 13,000 signatures to have the British government take up the investigation and look into the deaths of other Britons in Thailand. Yet another case was spurred on New Year's Day of 2014 when 25-year-old Nick Pearson from Derby was found floating in the sea. Police told Nick's family that he had likely fallen from 50 feet and drowned. But just as with Ben's case, his parents were unconvinced that it was an accident, and they believed that he had been murdered. Nick had been out celebrating New Year's Eve by having a meal and drinks with his family before he disappeared. His father Graham had been the last person to see him when he walked with his son back to where the family was staying. They hadn't realized he was missing until the next morning when he didn't answer the door. Nick had been found by scuba divers in the sea. Despite the police's insistence that Nick had simply fallen, Derby coroner Louise Pinder said there was not enough evidence to say exactly how he died and recorded his death as an open verdict. Due to the suspicious nature of Nick's death, an inquest was open into the case. Pathologist Dr. Michael Biggs told the hearing that Nick's body had too many injuries to his head, face, and limbs to be sustained in an accidental fall. They had to have occurred before his death. But there was not enough evidence to come to a concrete conclusion about what had happened to Nick. His mother claims that it was her gut feeling that Nick had been assaulted and that his death was no accident. She has warned others not to allow their children to travel to the cursed death island of Koh Tao. Then, in September 2014, two British travelers, Hannah Witheridge and David Miller, were visiting Koh Tao. They had met on the island and hit it off as they stayed at the same hotel. But one night, as they walked back to the hotel rooms from where they had been drinking at a bar, they were attacked. They were later both found dead, each suffering from head wounds. Thai police reported that the two of them had been seen arguing with an alleged gangster at the bar and that Hannah had turned down his advances. In the autopsy, it was revealed that Hannah had sexual contact before her death, and authorities believed that she might have been assaulted. The Thai police said that they still believe sexual jealousy is at the heart of this crime. David was knocked out before he was drowned, as the post-mortem found water in his lungs. David's family believes that the night he was killed, he was trying to stop Hannah from being attacked before they were both brutally murdered. 
The investigation into their deaths has been wildly criticized because the crime scene was not properly secured, and some of the evidence may have been tampered with. Because of this, any DNA evidence that was recovered has been received with doubt by those outside of Thailand authorities. The Bangkok hospital where they were taken has been accused of botching or corrupting the DNA in the autopsy reports in order to blame two Burmese workers, Wei Piao and Zha Lin, who are currently on death row over the killings. David's family had called the verdict justice, but the sentencing has also been seen as a violation of human rights, as the evidence against the Burmese workers was slim. David's family later appealed for leniency for his killers after it was revealed that the two men initially confessed to the killings under torture. Despite the family's plea, the death sentence verdict was upheld. In the end, David's family does seem to believe that the right men have been convicted and have said that the evidence is overwhelming and we feel justice has been done, though they do not want to see the men killed for the crime. But the ramifications from the double murder of Hannah and David did not end there. A 25-year-old backpacker named Sean McAnna, who had spent 18 months living on Koh Tao prior to the killing, was actually a friend of David Miller. After his attempt to meet up with David on the night of the murder turned up fruitless, Sean grew suspicious. He knew something was wrong, especially given the questionable reputation of the area. But when he stuck his nose into the case, he reportedly found himself face to face with the insidious underbelly of the Koh Tao Mafia itself. When two men heard him conversing about the homicide in a local bar, they roughly pulled him aside and gave him a spine-chilling warning that they could easily kill him and frame his death, leading others to believe he had taken his own life. But underlying this threat was an even more concerning implication, that the two supposed mafia men were intent on pinning David and Hannah's murders on Sean himself. Sean recounted the horrifying conversation, saying, They just said to me, We know you killed them. You're going to hang yourself tonight and we're going to watch you hang. You will die tonight. So I just ran. Sean's story follows that he fled to a grocery store close by and frantically posted a status on social media crying out for help, alerting his friends of his sketchy situation. The Facebook post read, Thai Mafia are trying to kill me, please help. Police were called, but perhaps unsurprisingly, they did not arrest the threatening men. Luckily though, Sean was able to escape with his life, just barely by escaping the grocery store while police were present and subsequently hiding in the murky jungle of Koh Tao before fleeing the island altogether at the first opportunity. He later proclaimed, they need a scapegoat and they don't want it to be locals. They want it to be a Westerner. So if I kill myself here, then it's easy to say, see, it was him. He shared that he genuinely thought he was done for in that moment as he knew it would be a simple task for the two strong men to take him up into the hills and dispose of him discreetly. Dimitri Poves, a Frenchman visiting the island in 2015, was found on New Year's Day, just like Nick Pearson. Like Elise, it was ruled that he had taken his own life, even though all physical evidence proved otherwise. The strongest evidence against this is that he was found hung in his bungalow with his hands tied behind his back. It would have been impossible for him to hang himself, especially with both hands tied behind his back. And yet, that is the story the Thai police believed. The police claim that because of the shape of the rope, tied to one hand with a loop for the other to be inserted, Dimitri could have done it himself. However, not everyone believed the police. As associate professor Charnkanit Kritya Surayamane, a criminologist and lecturer at the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities of Mahidol University, said he doubted their theory. Apparently, Dimitri had been so drunk before his death that he had very little control over himself, and he would have been unable to even tie himself up. Another British visitor to the island was Christina Ansley in January 2015. 
She died very shortly after arriving on Koh Tao. The police claimed that her death was simply caused by her mixing alcohol with the antibiotics she was taking for a chest infection. Because of this, her death was never investigated, and a toxicology report was never even done. Her cause of death was ruled circulatory failure caused by drugs and alcohol. Luke Miller, who was a bricklayer from Newport, was visiting Death Island in January 2016 for New Year's Eve. He had made a final Facebook post on arrival where he tragically said, can honestly say this new year I'm living the dream. He had traveled with his friend James Gissing, who joined his sister Nicola Gissing and some friends from Australia. Luke was found dead in a swimming pool at the Sunset Bar at Syri Beach on January 8th by a member of the hotel staff. After a short inquest, it was claimed that there was no evidence that he had been murdered as the post-mortem proved he had drowned. This claim of no evidence is weak to say the least, especially when James and friends were told by a police contact that Luke had been assaulted in a bar the night before his death and that they were treating the case as a murder. Yet, when they tried to contact the man again, they were told there was no way to confirm that the man had been a Thai police officer. Later in the investigation, the police claimed that they no longer believed that Luke had been fighting or that he was murdered. James has said that he felt police were covering up as it was the death of another foreigner on Koh Tao. In the post-mortem, Luke was found to have a number of small bruises on his face and legs, and the autopsy concluded that he died of head injuries and drowning. His toxicology tests showed that he was one and three quarters above what the UK allows for alcohol consumption to drive and had traces of the drug Ritalin in his system. The Thai police took this information and have claimed that Luke must have struck the diving board of the pool which caused him to drown. Coroner Caroline Summeray agreed with the Thai police, saying that, it has been suggested this was a cover-up by the Thai authorities, but there has been a very thorough police report. Yet, Luke's sister, Maria, is doubtful and has said that she has been told there was speculation over his death, and there were a few different versions of what had happened to Luke, yet nothing concrete. Russian tourist Valentina Novozyonova vanished in 2016. The 23-year-old disappeared on Death Island after leaving her passport, phone, and all of her belongings in her hostel room. She was believed to be on the island to go freediving, something she was said to be an enthusiast of, and the area is famous for enticing many other backpackers to come and freedive in the clear waters. Valentina wasn't reported missing until she failed to check out of her hostel. Even then, the hostel manager assumed that she had simply left and continued traveling without bothering to check out. Her disappearance took days for anyone to notice. The Thai police chief said he had his teams check all surveillance cameras around the hostel area, yet all they found was a video of Valentina walking to Chalo Kin Khao and never returning. Police concentrated their search for her on finding the blue towel that they believe she left behind as she went diving and asked locals, tourists, and volunteers to look for traces of her near boulders and dive sites. However, when the towel wasn't uncovered, the search hit a dead end. Valentina seemed to be another lost cause with no leads from the very beginning. It wasn't until the police started to look at her phone records that they found that she had used the line messaging software to seek advice from a psychiatrist. The police revealed that in the messages, it was indicated that Valentina had an unreasonable fear, though they never specified what this was, and the psychiatrist advised her to seek help quickly. Along with the medication found in her bag, the Thai police were eager to share that Valentina's disappearance may have been due to her being troubled. With this conclusion, the search for her petered out. Regardless of not having very much evidence, the police have concluded that Valentina wanted to break a deep diving record at more than 24 meters and drown in her attempt. It wasn't until March 2017 that it finally looked like new answers may have been found when tissue, bone samples, 
and diving gear were uncovered in the sea, just off Koh Tao by divers on the seabed. A green vest and snorkeling goggles were also discovered about 400 meters from the resort where she was staying. So far, this was the best lead that investigators had since Valentina went missing. Police and volunteer divers began searching the area where the remains were found, hoping to find more clues and uncover what happened to her. The police believe that Valentina drowned as she was diving, yet when the DNA results were finally released, they proved negative. In fact, the flesh that the divers had recovered wasn't even human. The Thai Provincial Police Commander, Police Major General Apikart Bunsriroj, said they still believe that a water accident is the likely cause of her mysterious disappearance. He said, We still give more importance to a water accident rather than other cases. It's not about crime because Valentina liked to do free diving alone. So far, there are no more leads or clues that could reveal what actually happened to Valentina when she vanished on Death Island. The latest death is as recent as 2018 and is as mysterious as all the previous. 47-year-old Bernd Groch was a dad of one who was visiting the island to finish up some business he had with his own 20-year-old motorbike rental company. His family described him as fit, healthy, and happy as he was living in a house in the heart of the notorious jungle of Koh Tao. He was found dead in his home, and authorities claim that he had died of either heart failure or that a snake had bitten him. The evidence to conclude exactly how he had died would be in an autopsy. His family had wanted the respected independent forensic physician, forensic scientist, Dr. Pornthip Rajna Sunand, to perform the post-mortem, but were dismayed to find out that his body had been taken to the same Bangkok hospital that bungled the reports on what had happened to Hannah Witheridge and David Miller in 2014. Just as with many other cases in Thailand, the autopsy was never given to Byrne's family. Claims have been made by experts across the world that the DNA testing was tampered with to protect those guilty of Byrne's death. Theories claimed by others who have visited say that the island is a law unto itself with no resident police force. They say that the island is controlled by a small group of powerful Thai businessmen who seem to act with impunity. Another visitor noted that Koh Tao was a spooky place and that when they visited the island, they witnessed police busily packing up human bones that had just been fished out of the water, which apparently belonged to an Englishman who disappeared at sea and was devoured by sharks before his remains were found. Many of those who have visited the island advise that no one should visit Koh Tao alone. Recently, the Thai police have tried to restore their reputation of hiding evidence from previous cases by offering a public briefing on each case's details. At this point, there had been seven deaths on the island, including Elise Del Magna. The police claimed that of the seven cases, five have been solved. But most of the deaths have been ruled as either the individual taking their own life or simply accidents. At the briefing, Police Lieutenant General Tinait Pinmuangnam, acting Chief of Police Region 8, said, Some news reports pointed to a mafia gang on Koh Tao, but I assure you, after cooperating with the governor, military, and police who have taken part in maintaining order here, there is no such gang on the island, nor are there conflicts of interest. If anyone has proof to the contrary, please contact the governor or me. He also insisted that the security and safety on Koh Tao were good and that the police would recheck all closed circuit cameras to make sure they are in order. After the briefing, three more deaths occurred on the island. With 10 deaths concentrated on one small island, all targeting tourists and visitors, there is certainly too much evidence for all of it to be a coincidence. Are all the deaths connected? Or is there something about the island of Koh Tao that welcomes so much death? Allegedly, local authorities in Koh Tao have not taken kindly to the barrage of negative attention the island is receiving, least of all the title, Death Island. They have taken legal steps to oppose news media outlets like the Samui Times from popularizing this dark nickname and spreading the information about the string of murders haunting the tourist location. 
Mayor Chayant Turisical declared, the coverage damages the island's reputation and we have to take decisive action not to allow foreigners or other people to attack our economy and the credibility of our country. All the same, if nothing is done to remedy the serious problem with violence that seems to currently plague the island, it seems to be only a matter of time before travelers will become increasingly more hesitant to venture to the island and risk meeting the same fate as the many unfortunate individuals we've discussed today. Perhaps none of the deaths are related, but whether there really is an untouchable group of shady businessmen behind the murders or even a few of them, we may never know. Just as we may never find out who Elise Del Magna was running from, and if the cult of the Sai Baba was involved in her death, we do know for sure that the consistently corrupt and unwilling police force clearly works to suppress any information about the series of murders. And we can certainly conclude that there is something sinister happening at Koh Tao and that the island has an enduring reputation for death. If you have any information about any of the crimes mentioned today, please come forward to help authorities.